have uh, two uh, distinguished guests with us today to, to talk about this. Um, Oliver Hess uh, is the current Vice President and Head of Biotech Data Science and Digitalization for Bayer, based in Berkeley, California. He has a degree in biotechnology from the Technical, Technical University of Berlin and started his career in a biotech startup in Germany before joining Bayer in 2008 to work on automation, digitalization, and the application of data science in the biopharmaceutical industry. So uh, Oliver has been at this for a while. Uh, uh, and he can, I think, provide us uh, quite a bit of perspective. Um, our, our second guest is uh, Christopher Kopinski. Uh, Chris is a business development executive in the life sciences and healthcare, and uh, life sciences and healthcare at Amazon Web Services. Uh, in his role, Chris leads uh, teams focused on tackling customer problems through digital transformation. Uh, this experience includes leading business process intelligence and data science programs within the global technology organizations and improving outcomes uh, through data-driven de development practices. Welcome, Oliver and Chris. Thanks for having us. Sure. Thanks. So, um, you know, uh, you are both uh, have been very active in this space for a while. Um, obviously, I think are in the throes of digital transformation, um, either helping other companies or within your own company. Uh, you know, one of the the common questions we hear when people are talking about digital transformation is you know, where do I start? Um, obviously, we, we showed that tech stack. There's a lot of elements there. Um, sometimes it's confusing, overwhelming at times. Um, you know, do you start sequentially? Is it a parallel activity? Um, so, uh, you know, Oliver, uh, maybe we can start with you. You've been leading this at, at Bear for a while. Um, what are some of the best practices you're seeing around, around this particular question? Well, uh, there's a, actually, I think there's different schools of thought on that. Um, and I don't think there is just one answer. Um, so the one answer to that is you go you know, with very specific use cases. Right? And you pick one use case where you have you know, defined outcome that you want to achieve, and you run it through and have this one use case, if a great pilot, and then you take the next one. Right? Um, there's also, to that end, however, a nice article from McKinsey that's called the pilot purgatory. Right? <laughs> so the problem that you have there is you, you may dip your feet into the water, but you're not getting really wet. Right? Um, and so you may not get all of what digital transformation may be promising out of that one use case. Right? You may get you know, some acceptance and you get some experience, but it's not the full experience. And so I think... Um, what, you ought, what we don't want to do is you build up all the capabilities and all the tech stack without a certain purpose, right? But at the same time, you need to lay some good foundations, right? So you need to have a certain tech stack, I think, in place, at least at you know, some basic level, to be able then to also you know, get from that one use case maybe relatively quickly to the next and build upon that, right? Um, so I think building somewhat in parallel is important, right? But it's, at the same time, also not just about technology, because you know, mainly it's about people, and it's about you know, the, the mindset of people. So that is the next parallel approach that you have to take. So I don't think there's you know, the one clear answer, but in my opinion, having certain use cases that show you, demonstrate you know, benefits, while at the same time building out capabilities. And then, of course, you need to work with and on the people. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that, Oliver. And actually, um, there isn't one right answer. I mean, we've, we've, we've seen success in both areas. I think the most important er thing to consider is to start. Because I, I, I believe you know, many of our companies could get into and uh, organizations we work with can get into what would be like analysis paralysis. Uh, we have this kind of axiom, you know, think big, start small, scale fast. The key part around that is start small. Like as you think, everyone can think big, everyone can have a great vision. Um, starting small is the hard part. You know, you mentioned the use case approach. We've actually found customers have a lot of success with that, which is um, if you're from the Six Sigma community, you hear the saying, go to the Gemba. Go to where your users are. Go to where uh, people are having real pain, struggling with what they're trying to achieve, and go interview them. Go understand what they need. Um, I. I now this is probably about three years old, but an example 
of this was uh, work we did with Novartis. You know, the think big was we're gonna digitally transform all of supply chain and manufacturing. Well, what does that mean? How do you do that? The first thing we did was we went to one site, we went to one line, and we found users that were having pain points that we felt we could address. We picked a use case and we, we identified an opportunity to deliver value for that one use case. Um, you know, there are other elements to how you actually sustain this, but by doing that, we were able to demonstrate value and create a foundation that we could build on and bring to the rest of the sites that they wanted to transform. So I think there's a lot of examples. I think everybody in the room probably has good examples, but I think that's some things to consider. But the, maybe to that point, it's important that you build some foundations while you do that, yeah. right? So you build maybe one around, totally agree, with one pain point, one use case, but while you do that, think ahead, right? What you may want to do next, right? And, and have in mind that you can build something upon it and not just build, you know, totally blindsided one thing. 100%. So as a corollary to this, you know, you are obviously dealing with legacy systems and the evolution of a new set of solutions within the ecosystem. How, how are you handling this challenge of marrying, or either deciding, right, we, we have a legacy system and we're gonna, we're gonna stick with some and marry them to the new ones or get rid of this and go to a new one. I mean, I'm sure there's these conversations that are happening as well in your organizations. How are you handling the, the, uh, the, the change from legacy to, to the newer systems? Um. There's so many, you know, not so nice legacy systems that you may just want to leave it alone, right? <laughs> um, it, it's in the end a question of, you know, um, how much value is in there, right? Um, what does it help you and how much effort is it to, to work with some of the legacy systems, right? So if you don't get the data out, you have no API, you have no way of getting it out, so what are you going to do, right? Um, that is certainly a problem. We have thought about, you know, a number of things. Um, but then always was the question, okay, how much can we actually learn from that data that is in there, right? How much, to the point of context, how much can we actually get it out in context, right? So that we really learn something from it. Um, I don't think we have a definite answer at this point, honestly, you know, at least where we are currently. Um, however, one thing that we are looking at is if we implement new technology, new solutions, right? Um, we, we strive for actually latest technology, right? Um, where, you know, there is the, the opportunity to actually exchange that at one point, right, and get the data out. And, and I think that's one of the important pieces, not only get it out, but, but have it in our own hands. Um, but, you know, the, the legacy technologies are to some extent a problem, but, you know, it's a question of how far do you want to look back versus just look ahead and do it better now. And then, of course, it also depends on, on you know, where you are. Are you an established manufacturing site that looks back at 20 years of you know, commercial data, or are you embarking in something very new? You just open up a new, or you're planning a new cell therapy facility. Right? Yeah, understanding the strategy is really important because um, we often get into these areas where you know, the, our IT, the, the IT organization within the, the, the customers we work with want to take advantage of everything like the cloud has to offer. So we're gonna move everything to the cloud. Well, in, in, in reality, that doesn't necessarily solve your problem. It actually could create more challenges if you don't think about what is the strategy for the business and, and create a plan for what you wanna do in the short term, what you wanna do in the midterm, and what you wanna do in the long term. And so there are legacy systems that may be legacy and, and it may stay that way. Um, but where we focus is what is your business strategy? In the short term, how do we create value? How do we demonstrate progress? And how do we learn so that we could build that into plans for uh, migrating or transforming the rest of the systems that are existing? And, and, and some systems might just not end up transforming. Um, so this question is for Oliver. We've had conversations in the past about and of course, you can answer as well too, Chris. As I said, Oliver, <laughs> we've had questions, uh, uh, conversations in the past about the sustainability of digital transformation efforts. Uh, some of the necessary elements that you've mentioned, and we've heard from other folks, you know, include sort of the ideas of adoption, engagement, and then you know, integrations. 
So um, can you talk a little bit about some of the methodologies that you found successful uh, in driving sustainability for some of the solutions that you're deploying um, at Bayer right now? Well, I think there, there's a couple of things. Um, first of all, it, you know, there should be value for the people that use it, right? Um, that always is so that's the what's in it for me piece, right? Um, uh, however, that, you know, Sometimes you want to have something that may add some, some step somewhere to, for the greater benefit, right? Um, and that's where I think have to work with whoever is using it very closely. Right? So, and, and really walk people through it, you know, why are we doing this, what is it, and, and be there for their questions, concerns, you know, and, and work with them on the floor, wherever they are, right? Um, that includes also to, you know, to meet them where they, where they are, meaning you know their understanding, right? Talk their language at that particular point. Um, I think those are you know the fundamentals, right? It goes back to classical change management, right? Um, I think another point along that is then education, right? So how can we educate people? Um, because it goes back to we meet them where they are. Um, if you tar start talking about AI and cloud and I don't know what, right? Um, many people don't understand it or they have no real idea what that actually means. So um, you need to, to meet them, you need to educate them, right? And, and then through that, get them on that path of, of using it. I think that it has been, that's where we have seen the greatest success if we also had, you know, on. A, our end of things, so from a digitalization perspective, very strong you know, leaders that had very good interactions and drove that solution into the different labs, into the different environments, right, where they were there more or less every day, for a certain period, to, to help them, right? You know, I actually approach this kind of from a more, let's say, macro level. Uh, you know, I, I kind of ask the question or think about the question is how do we, how do we know that change is being sustained? So if we go out five, ten years from now and we say, have we actually really sustained the change we've been trying to? I actually think of you know the conference we're at. You know, we call it the digital CMC conference. Maybe in ten years it'll just be the CMC conference because digital really implies there's a there's a technology component to it and. And that's the key thing that I think everyone's trying to understand how to bring into their organizations, but it's really not a technology problem. And I think we talk about this a lot. It's a people and a process problem as well. It's not just a technology. The technology needs to evolve. But when we look at who are the companies and, and, and the organizations that I work with and who are the ones that are talking about digital CMC and who are the ones actually doing digital CMC, it really boils down to, I think, you know, three elements that we see. I think one is, you know, leadership within that organization really needs to be bought in. And they need to be aligned because it's not going to be a single organization called digital that's going to make this change last. They're going to have to be able to set a clear direction and help align their organization towards a common goal and a long-term goal. This is not a short-term thing. The other is we see setting aggressive goals being aggressive about this change. It's not, it's not about having a goal that is unachievable, it's actually about trying to drive the change faster than it would happen organically. Because something like this really needs that top-down push where the organization's behind you and, and giving you the ability to fail. And I think the third thing which you were getting at, which is I think often sometimes overlooked is this is new. We need to bring training in, we need to enable our people I think within AWS, we're training thousands of people a year, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people a year, because it is important that we give the people that are implementing, the people that are using, the people that are working with the tools, the necessary resources they, they need to make this happen. Yeah, I think that uh, um, one of the key elements that you know we're certainly seeing is that if you don't um, bring in significant uh, resources uh, to support deployment, right, and manage deployment and teach people as, as things are being deployed, then, you know, implementations tend to kind of peter out, right? And, uh, and so I think the, the organizations that are out there 
with new solutions that are coming in behind the sale of that solution with uh, strong deployment resources and support are probably going to be the ones that will sustain the change as you're, uh, as you're, as you mentioned. I, I think it's, the, the deployment is one thing, right? But really, in the end, what you're striving for is with digital transformation, you're trying to transform, you know, something legacy to something better, let's put it this way, right? So it is really about, you know, deployment is one part that needs to be nice, right? But then how do you, get people to actually do it in a different way and keep on doing it and not after three months or five months fall back to the Excel sheet because they couldn't log in or they didn't understand or right. you, know, you have no procedure. I mean, some of those yeah. things you definitely have to proceduralize, right? Put out best practices. This is how you gotta do it. And those, that goes then back to you know, leadership or you know, top down as, as well, right? This is just how we do it. So you raised an interesting point about about uh, operationalizing that the either the technology or, or or noting it in the in the SOP of of interest, right? Can you talk a little bit about when that decision point comes that it's time to, you know, uh, time to put that in the SOP, and and I assume you're working with quality at that point to to uh, make that happen. So what are some of the conversations that happen at that point in time? Quite honestly, you have to talk to Yoshka. Because <laughs> he had those conversations. Um, I don't think it's just quality, right? I mean, quality is not necessarily the owner of the SOP. They may have a say in it, right? But there's, there's others that, that have a say in the, in the SOPs, right? So um, and, and whether that is in, the, in a formal SOP or just in a best practice, right? Um, but to some degree, proceduralized. But on the other hand, you know, it should be, if you're talking about quality, many people see always quality as the, or QA, as the, 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 the you know, decelerating factor or, or the blocking factor. Why should they, right? I mean, it should be in the best interest of every quality organization, right, that you have nice and structured and, and um, efficient ways to, to handle your, your processes. Fantastic. Uh, Chris, I'm going to start this question with you. So uh, there's a lot of uh, discussion these days about Pharma 4.0, and uh, some would argue that many organizations are still at 2.0, and in some cases, 1.0. Um, how do you see organizations navigating this journey as these technologies advance rapidly? And believe it or not, people are talking about 5.0 yeah. and 6.0, <laughs> right. and, and, and I'm sure a lot of people are sitting here saying we haven't even achieved 4.0. And so, um, you know, I think it's a good question. It's a really good question because we see a lot of these frameworks and we see a lot of these kind of bars being set that if you're digital, digitally mature, you're at this bar. And, you know, AWS has a maturity model. I think if I talk to anyone in this room, everyone's got a different lens on what it actually means to be 4.0. Um, those frameworks are important, but I don't think they're they're there with the intention to make everyone feel as every single site, every single process, every single operation needs to be at this bar, needs to implement these principles. I think it comes back to that topic around what is your strategy? What's important for your business? What do you need to have at 4.0? And what is legacy that may never actually make it 4.0? So, you know, example I see all the time in this space is we talk in, it was one of the questions yesterday around cell and gene therapy. Um, a lot of times these sites are, are net new. They're kind of opportunities to rethink what digital means. Um, organizations I go into, they don't even want to use paper. That's not everybody, but there are, there, they are there. They're, they're going in with the mindset where we will not use paper. We will be a digital organization. We will implement 4.0. And they're working from a blank slate. But I also go into a lot of organizations where I have 50, <coughs> 50 manufacturing sites. I have all these different modalities that I have to support and all these different organizations. And I think it, it really boils down to really understanding, you know, what are, what are your, what's, your, what's your organization goals? What's your strategy on how you achieve it? And then of, within that, say, framework or model, what's important for you to get there? Um, and, 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 and work towards it and, and, and not necessarily try to do it all at once. And, and you have to see certain, let's say, financial or commercial realities there as well, right? So if you yeah. have an established plan, right, 
Um, it makes money, right? And well, if you can get more efficient, great, right? But you don't just want to deploy something, you know, for the sake of having some toyful technology, right? Um, so there needs to be a business case behind that, right? That supports that, or that you know gives you uh, in, another advantage there. So. Um, as you said, not everybody needs to be everywhere at this 4.0 level or you know, whatever metrics you have. Um, and there could be areas where you're perfectly fine in even having people that, that do certain processes that may not be optimal, right? But it's the most efficient or it's the most economic way to do it. Yeah, and that's, I think, an important point for the audience to understand as well. I think a lot of these conversations that happen around Farmer 4.0 are like, well, you just, we all need to be there, right? And if you're not there, you're just behind, right? And it kind of creates a little bit of panic around, well, we're just, you know, how are we gonna get there and what are we gonna do? And people just kind of running around trying to figure it out. But I think that's a really important point that you both raised that everything doesn't need to be there and, and we all don't need to be there. And it's important to pick what's, what should be there and what shouldn't be there. So, um, uh, excellent. Um, so the CMC life cycle is complex and it includes multiple dimensions of data to holistically describe a robust control strategy. But most people tend to think uh, in their own subset of work, which may only incorporate a couple of dimensions uh, of that data. So what are your thoughts on possible strategies to help those earlier in the life cycle recognize the impact of their work on those later in the life cycle? Want to go first? <laughs> I'll, let, I'll, I'll, let you, I'll let you respond to me this time. Um, so I, I try to use analogies, and um, you know, one we one we have here is actually within Amazon. We 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 have leadership principles, and one of them is is ownership. And so ownership, what that means is you, you don't sacrifice the long term value for short term gains, and you think you know you think in a way that you. Um, you're approaching each of these areas as if it's your own, you know, your your own thing. And so, uh, our our chairman Jeff Bezos has an example that he uses to describe it. Is when he was a kid, uh, his parents used to rent houses, and one of the houses they were renting uh, had a Christmas tree nailed to the floor, and and that made him think, you know, if, if it, and that put it into, you know, concrete, like if this, if the people that lived here were actually thinking long-term, they were gonna be in this house, they would never nail a Christmas tree to the floor. So wh why do I say that? I think it's, you know, we often tend to be in our world, in our scope, how do we solve the thing? How do I make the deliverable easy for me without thinking about the long-term? What does this imply for the long-term of what we're trying to do? So when, when I think about, um, ownership it's you know in our in our space it is about breaking down those silos it is about working in what we like to call two pizza teams you know teams that you could feed with two pizzas that are cross-functional bringing regulatory and bringing quality and bringing manufacturing and uh, bringing your process development your scientists and working on what is the outcome that we're trying to achieve where do we want to go because I think when you start to approach problems that are outside of that siloed mentality, you start to think about what you can achieve or do in the short term that puts you in that long term. So it you help, helps you make the decisions you need to early on that are gonna get you on that path long term. I like the two pizza teams. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, I think it, it comes down to, as you said, ownership in, in certain respect. <clears throat> But also leadership, right? And not leadership necessarily just from the highest level, from the Jeff Bezos, but you know, somewhere in the middle, right? That people should have an overview of, well, it's not just this one task, right? And just because you know it's easier for you today to do it in Excel or just write down things on a piece of paper, right? That two months from now you may have, you know, a lot more work to do. Um, so that goes, I think, back to that leadership at some middle level, right? To actually say you know, this is not the way we do it because, and I have to overview, this is gonna happen later on. Um, but that needs, again, education. <clears throat> There's also probably a, a part of, you know, the art of the possible, right? So if people don't know that there are tools, right? If they don't know that there's, I mean, if, even if you go to Excel, there's a pivot table, right? And don't know how to use it, then 
they may do more work than they need to, right? And so it goes back to education, right? So what are things that can actually be done to help you going down, you know, even two weeks, four weeks, two years, right? And if I write down every day again something, why not automate it? Well, you know, you need to help people understand what is possible there. And, it, you know, you talked about um, the, the pains that specific users have, right? So that then is, okay, can we see what is going on actually on the floor? And it's, you know, usual principles of, I don't know, operational excellence, where you, in this case, may not want to continuously do small increments of improvement, but, you know, you can leap then a little bit as well. So, Chris, um, you know, one of the, the uh, we don't hear this anymore, but, you know, in the beginning there was uh, certainly for us this question about a comfort level with putting things in the cloud, right? Um, and, uh, you know, we had at that point had the opportunity to point to, you know, a scenario that a where a large pharma company had got hit by ransomware and some of the issues that they had around that, right? And, you know, I'm curious to hear how um, when AWS was coming out, rolling out the cloud and talking to, to pharma companies and life science companies, you know, how they got them comfortable with the idea that, you know, you can put your most valuable information, some of your most valuable information uh, in a place that you don't control, yeah. right? And uh, um, because there's, I think, some lessons for all of us who are developing new technologies around that conversation, yeah. right? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure who you talk to. I still hear that from time to time. Um, maybe not in this room as, as we're, we're part of a community here, but um, I do think, you know, as, as you take all this input and you go back to your organizations, you will hear that still. You know, there's, there's a lot of questions, um, uncertainty, and, and doubts that come with uh, any kind of really big transformation that's happening. So, you know, a lot of people don't realize, but you know, AWS and at least our cloud is 15 years old. And in a lot of ways, there's parts, there's a big component of it that's quite mature. Um, but as well as there's a lot of pieces that are still emerging, still maturing. We talk about machine learning, AI, explainability, all these components that we're continuously always trying to, to, to mature. So to answer your question, I mean, I would say that question is, is not being had at like the macro level. You know, pharma's been moving uh, data to AWS and the cloud for over eight or nine years now. We've had a practice dedicated to that. Uh, data, you know, the data lakes exist. Um, the applications that are at the enterprise level are all, all, all moving there. I think what we find though is that, um, you know, there are a lot of, there are a lot of capabilities out there that are, are misunderstood or, or people are still coming back to training, understanding how to implement for their own space. So there are services, um, you know, there are 300 services that manage governance, security, um, privacy, uh, clouds compliant to, I think over 100 different security uh, protocols, especially in healthcare with HIPAA, GDPR, those kind of things. But I think what we find, and at least my guidance to a lot of our uh, a lot of the organizations we work with is you don't have to move everything there. You have to earn trust with your, your partners and your providers. Um, we like to call it the undifferentiated heavy lifting. The, the, the areas you're less concerned about, that, the areas where your core competency is not managing data centers. That's our core competency. We're not in the business of bringing innovative medicines to patients. That's your core competency. Let us take that undifferentiated heavy lifting off your off your shoulders, so you could focus on what you do best, which is which is manage your business. And as you as you go through that um, evolution of understanding and, and working with the new technology, we'll bring more and more of that to to the data or to the to the cloud. So it, it's it's a it's a it's a journey. It's not a it's not a one 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 thing. Um, Oliver, from from your side of the coin, how was that conversation? I mean, were you the one that went to somebody and said, "Hey, we need to." We Move actually had AWS? one of the first AWS accounts, at least in, in the pharma space, um, you know, in, in Bayer, in the pharma, you yeah. know, the biotech group was the first that had actually the AWS accounts. 
And it's been evolving, you know, we, we have at least a very nice, I think a very nice framework around that within, you know, our guardrails, what we can and cannot do on, on AWS. Um, but my, my, my sentence would always be, why would you trust our data center in Leverkusen more than, you know, somebody, some, some you know, company that does it professionally, right? So but I think there, there was also not too much, you know, well, has it, well, there was hesitancy, but you know, from a corporate perspective, that was relatively clear that we want to move in that direction. I think the last couple of years have accelerated that. Um, but on the other hand, as you said, not everything is moving towards the cloud, and I think we need to differentiate there. And specifically, if you look at you know manufacturing, manufacturing networks, you know there are still layers that are far away from the cloud, right? That are you know within you know our environment. Right, where you really look at the manufacturing floor. That is the question, I think, and I don't have a good answer right now, but where is that headed, right? So if you're really very close to, to production level. And, and I'd add too, and a lot of, um, a lot of the, let's say, the, the maturity or the uh, evolution of adopting these technologies is actually starting to, I'm starting to see that um, percolate behind, beyond the IT organization. So, building your uh, quality practices around how the data is being managed. You talked about FAIR, you talked about these different principles. Um, it's, it's, it's another data center, it's just not in your facility. Um, but as you work with these new technologies, incorporating them into how you govern your business becomes important. So there are, there are tools to help automate that, uh, but then there's also, you know, just working with your, your quality organization, your, your regulatory organization, or your, your legal organizations on how you're putting the right controls in place or how we've put the right controls in place to help you put the controls in place to, to ensure that your, your data is secure, so. But it, I think it's not just about, you know, security is one piece, right? But definitely a very important one. Yeah. <laughs> But also capabilities just, right? I mean, um, if you looked in the past, you wanted to do, you know, wanted to test something, wanted to build something new, right? Well, now you had to go and buy a server, right? That takes five weeks and have to get somebody who is actually spinning it up. And now you had invested, I don't know how many thousand dollars in, in setting all these things up. And it took you three months and well, you find out it doesn't work, right? Now you have this nice piece of hardware sitting there that you can't do any or that you, is wasted, right? If we go to the cloud environment, well, I spin up the environment and I break it down, done, right? Yeah. You save time, money, and everything. So I think there's, you know, it outweighs the benefits outweigh, you know, any concerns there. Yeah. Exactly. I guess, you know, radical, radical cost reduction is something that I think has helped probably with that, with that as well, right? Yeah. I mean, really, really significant uh, financial benefits to, to, to moving in the cloud is something that you know, people can say, okay, well, you know, this is, there's a significant advantage here to do this from a business operations perspective, so. But then, maybe, maybe one other point to that is, is also, if you look at technology, right? Moving to the cloud is one thing, right? But if you take your, as you, as you pointed out earlier, your legacy environments to the cloud, right? Great, but ideally, of course, whatever you build, you build it somewhat cloud native, right? You use the services that are there, right? And not just put an outdated database into a container and run it on, on the AWS now, but really use the technologies that, that give you advantages, right? That are scalable, that are, you know, in a, in a modern landscape. Yeah, cost, cost tends to be the first, the, it checks the business case box, but where we see the most benefit is actually in helping drive more agility yeah. and speed in what you're doing. And to your point, you don't have to wait the 10 to 12 weeks to get the hardware procured and you know, with the supply chain issues, it's probably even more now. Yeah. So you just, you just go into your environment, spin it up, do your experiment, test your hypothesis, and then spin it back down um, is, is the very simplest way to get value out of that. All right, I'm gonna spice up the conversation a little bit because I like to be provocative. Can you give Dan a microphone, please? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't know I was gonna throw him into the mix here, but, um, but uh, this is, I'm gonna ask this question around the new computer software assurance um, guidance that came out. 
So I came out and I pulled in our head of quality, uh, Adrienne O'Reilly, and I said, let's read this and see, is there actually anything here, right? And so uh, you know, as we looked at it, um, one of the things that we noticed that has not changed is that you still have to, de you still have to demonstrate that it is fit for purpose, yes. for the intended use, Correct. right? Which is the performance qualification that ultimately has to happen, right? So my question is, ultimately, has anything actually changed with the, with the CSA? I don't know if you've had any opportunity to, to think about this. It's relatively new. We also know that CDER did not sign up to this yet, right? This is CDRH, and maybe CBER signed up, I, I think, uh, as well. But um, any thoughts on, uh, on that? And then we'll let you, yeah. uh, since you were in it for four years, we'll let you opine on that as well. Sure. <laughs> I mean, um, yes, we are, I mean, I think it's, it's a draft out for comments right now and, and our teams and myself are, are looking at it and coming up with our comments and plan to submit those soon. Um, I, I do think we're, it is, a, it is in the right direction of what we're looking for, right? You know, it's been a long time since we've really looked at how we're, we're, we're managing the compliance and validation in the space and, and recognizing that quality system assurance is, is an important approach. Um, but I think we're still we're still in the phase of how do we make sure there's more uh, in there that allows for what we were talking about agility, speed, actually realize what what the intent was to help um, to help our, our our organizations move faster. Uh, I I haven't read it, <laughs> <laughs> but you know everything that supports this agility, right? Then yeah. We've been <clears throat> there <have> been <clears throat> sorry been going a good way to actually incorporate, you know, if, if we have an agile project, how, mm -hmm. how do we actually make sure that we, that we validate that somehow, right? Um, I think we have a decent framework now, right, uh, for that, but everything that supports this is highly welcome, right? Yep. But, I mean, I, many people are always afraid of, oh, validation and, and this and that. Um, I always saw it just as, you know, demonstrate that what you say that you're doing, you actually do it, yep. right? That's it. And, and Dan, I'd love your, your thoughts on that too in the, in the group. I think if anyone hasn't had a chance to read it, I, I urge you to go read it. Uh, you know, urge your organizations to, to, to comment on the draft um, because I do think it's, it's important. I know um, we continue in at least our role to help educate, inform, and support the FDA in their, in their ambitions to help us move closer in this, uh, but it really requires our community to, to, to do that, so. What I would say is this is an evolution, not a revolution. We're not starting from scratch. I've heard a lot of organizations say, oh, CSA is gonna change the game, is gonna totally uh, transform the way we do things. And, and one of the things we, we recognize within the team uh, that's working with FDA is the fact that nothing that's in this new guidance couldn't have been done with the guidance that was written 22 years ago by Al Taylor and, and uh, at, at the FDA. Um, what it does is it provides additional clarity because as an industry, we tend to tie our own two hands behind our backs and blame the regulators for the fact that we can't do something. So the example is no more IQO, QPQ, right? You don't see that, those terms in CSA, but if you look the at the original guidance, the, it, there is a paragraph that talks about the fact that the terms IQO, Q, and PQ are not applicable to software. However, because that's what industry and regulators are comfortable with, that's the term that we're going to use. So what it does is it provides additional clarity. To your point, Yash, it really focuses on intended use rather than requirements. The days of writing the system shall, A, B, C, and, and then list 100 pages worth of requirements are done. Because when, especially if you're using a cloud application, it does what it does. Once you selected that particular cloud app, you can configure the 20%, but the 80% of what it does is what it does. 
So the focus really becomes on how do I assure that my intended use of the application meets my needs. And it also, frankly, puts a lot, a, a, a higher burden on the software and infrastructure, and pro, infrastructure providers because it allows industry to take credit for work that has been done. So the industry is going to go to their technology partners and say, show me that the out-of-the-box functionality works the way you intended it. That OQ goes away, if you will, right? To use that ancient terminology. Because the out-of-the-box functionality, you'll show me that it works, you'll give me digital evidence to prove that you've tested it using your digital testing tools that can run hundreds of thousands of scripts in the amount of time that it takes a human to test one module. You can test the application 100,000 times over. Those are the things that it does. The other piece is it truly focuses on or intends for industry to focus on a risk-based approach based on a feature and function as opposed to if the system has one feature and function that is critical or high risk, then the entire system has to be validated with scripted testing. It introduces error guessing. You know, when we first talked about it to some folks in CSV, they're like, you can't guess errors. How can you, a regulator tell you that you can guess for errors? No, no, it's a legitimate, T testing technique. You give it to the person who knows how to use the system. You don't idiot-proof scripts because what we were doing is we were hiring idiots to test scripts, to run test scripts. Right? You don't need to know anything about the system. Follow the steps. Right? What, we're what this is saying instead is give it to the expert who's going to actually, to Oliver's point, the person who's going to run the, so the software, who knows how it should work, and tell them, find the bugs. Tell me where it, it breaks. So it is a evolution in the right direction. It isn't going to revolutionize the industry. It, is lowering barriers, is providing additional clarity because as an industry, we tied our own hands behind our back. Thank I you. I hope that helps. No, that's fantastic. And I think that's, it's, an, it's important to note, I think some people are, are misinterpreting what it, can, what it means, right? It, like as you <coughs> mentioned, that some people are saying, oh, well this just cleans, this wipes the slate clean and we can do what we want to do. And no, that's not, the, that's not actually the case, right? So. Okay, well, I think we now are gonna move on to the Q&A uh, session. So um, uh, this is an opportunity to ask some very knowledgeable people about some of your questions and concerns as you think about how to bring uh, your digital capabilities to your, to your CMC organizations. Good morning. Uh, first question, when we think about the digital transformation journey, uh, one of the items we're talking about is sort of the breaking down of silos. Um, Oliver, you talked about the importance of leadership and driving through things. Chris, you mentioned the skill set of um, ownership and the importance there. And yesterday in our keynote, we heard the technology is here, the regulatory guidance is here. So let's talk a little bit about the people. And I think you guys both touched about that. From your perspective, um, especially when we think about <clears throat> middle management or people actually driving the change, what are some of the critical attributes that those people need to have outside of just core change management capabilities? What do you see being successful uh, in your organizations or organizations that you work with in terms of helping bring that change along? Well, I think first of all, you have to have an idea. Right? So an idea where you want to go. We can call it a vision, right? But, but where do we actually want to take it? Um, I, I think that's the first one. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody needs to be the expert on you know, digital technologies. Um, and I don't expect necessarily my head of biotech to be the expert on digital technologies, right? But he could set goals um, that are only achievable with digital transformation. So our 
site manager at one point told me, he was like, you know, the way I like to achieve this is to set, to your point, over-aggressive goals, right? Goals that are not achievable without changing something, right? So I think that is, that is one aspect. And that's where you need to, I think, get your more senior leaders to. Because it's not enough just to say, hey, we're going to digitally transform. Because right? what does that mean? Um, at the same time, I think you're talking about what attributes need to people have. Need to people have. Well, you know, you need to have then also people that understand the technologies. And going back to the art of the possible, what is actually possible? Right? What can you do? What can you not do? Um, it doesn't help to just say, hey, we're going to put in the data lake, right? And we heard that a couple of times, and apply some AI. Well, that both of those are pretty broad terms, right? Um, so you need to be a little bit more educated in that or have the right people that actually understand it, right? And understand it also in the specific domain, I think. You know, that's, that's another critical part. Yeah, I'd add to that, <clears throat> because I, I talked a little bit about leaders, so people you know, it depends on which, so, you know, it's not a, a single person that's going to make this happen. So within the team, you know, you really do need to have the experts and the SMEs for their particular domain. Um, that that it's, it's still very important that you, you bring that along. But if you think about the, the people that are actually going to drive the change, the, the leaders of that group, um, you know, a couple additional things is, you know, that kind of entrepreneurial mindset, being willing to fail. Uh, you will fail. You will run into roadblocks, and and hopefully your leadership is there to support you and, and pick you back up and help you know uh, unblock the the blockers that you uncover, uncover. Uh, but also connector. You know I think this conference is a good example. Digital CMC. I mean it's not one single function's job, and so being able to connect the right people and the right stakeholders to the outcome is is absolutely important. And so I, I think there's, there's definitely attributes. I, I'd love to know if you have any additional ones that you'd like to add, but um, it, it, these, are, see, these are some of the things I see that in people that are successful in this area. And, and maybe to one other point, it, it's also that you cannot transform from the outside you know, no. some, some business, right? It needs to come from the inside, right? I mean, we have a digitalization, or well, I lead the digitalization group, but we can just support and maybe give ideas and you know, help, but in the end, it needs to come from within whatever CMC function it is. It needs to come within quality. It needs to come from within manufacturing, right? And then we can support them or we can give them ideas, but we can't just go out from in there from the outside and say, this is how you do it. It's the fact that very often companies will bring in an external group, a consulting firm, to say, Dig magically digitally transform my organization. And that doesn't work because it needs to be done from the inside out. Yes, you can bring in people that can facilitate the process, that can enable it, that can help you get there. But to outsource digital transformation is a fallacy. And unfortunately, there are many companies who are doing that and then finding themselves in a position where, yeah, I have all the technology, but nobody's using it. Thoughts? No, I, as I said, I totally agree, right? You, you can't just go in there and, and do something for a particular organization. It, it has to come organic. Well, I don't know whether it has to come organically, but it has to come from within. And as the term implies, right, they have to transform. And they have to be willing to transform and do things differently. Yeah, I also think it's an educational problem that most of the people working in a specific function, um, as Oliver explained also at the beginning, they have no understanding what's AI and this kind of stuff, right? So it, you need to educate them, but still they will never be a data scientist, right? So I think it's also... But they shouldn't. Yeah, I know, but uh, uh, to a certain extent you need... Um, people um, to for the rollouts and, and everything that understand both worlds, right? And these interdis uh, interdisciplinary people are very rare, right, to, to, to find someone that decided at some point, I want to be a, a developer for software with a bio background, something like that, right? So it, for me, this is really always the, the key enabler to that the people understand both worlds, right, that, that actually do it and um, 
for me, it's also very diffi uh, difficult. I'm a scientist. Uh, I worked for all of it for two and a half years. Uh, so, um, so I also have, a I mean, a certain understanding, but it's not, uh, I mean, not there. It's not the same as, as I was a software developer, right? So um, there's always this gap uh, that makes it difficult. Uh, so any thoughts how to improve? <laughs> well, you, you need in the end <clears throat> those facilitators um, that can translate between the worlds, right? I mean, you shouldn't be a data scientist, right? Um, and I, per, per, I see data scientists as, well, they're scientists, right? And they're not chemistry scientists or biology, they're on data, right? And they have specific skills. And not everybody can just say, hey, I'm not a now a data scientist, right? Um, but and they, you don't need to have them everywhere. Um, but you need people that, that have at least a basic understanding of what can you do with data science, maybe, right? What can you not do, right? And how can this apply to my world? We were, we were actually talking about this, uh, you know, earlier as, as we were preparing for this. And I, I think, you know, at one point, you know, there is that potential holy grail person that is a scientist and a data science. It's not, that's not common. And, and you can't expect that to be the norm going forward. However, you know, it needs to be coming from within, but you need to be willing to get input from outside. Sure. And, and so I think that's also important is um, a lot of problems are being solved with technology that many are not aware of or understand how best to implement or how best to leverage. And so, you know, I look at things like, you know, um, what you're doing at QBD Vision with, you know, graph database, your graph networks and how you're drawing relationships that couldn't be done with technology easily in the past. I mean, not everyone knows that. So you do need to work with partners to bring those ideas in. But from an ownership perspective, it's the team that's responsible for the outcome that owns it. Hi, I have a question. Um, so when you are preparing to make a change uh, within the business, how do you mentally prepare the company and the culture to have a mindset shift and accept what's coming down the pipe? Well, I think, first of all, you need to think about, <clears throat> you know, the size of the organization that you're talking about, right? So I'm not going to change the bear culture, right? That's 100,000 people that are across, you know, 160 com countries and, you know, several legacy organizations that have different cultures within Bayer, right? So I think, you know, number one, look at the scope of what your, what your department is or the, the function that you actually think about, right? That needs to be, or that should change or where you, the change is, is affecting that group. So and not to try to boil the ocean there, but you stay focused on those. And that's, that's number one. How do you prepare then? Well, you know, it's communication and you have to, I, I think there's a rule that you have to repeat something seven times until it sticks, right? I would say it's more 24 times or <laughs> 70 times, you know? So it's it's repeat 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 right and get it in from different angles right? we we had a conversation a little bit earlier it's context right maybe it's not you know you know bring in different perspectives explain from different angles of what you're trying to achieve right for for different personas you know those are the the, the first things i would think of yeah i would agree the, the the conversation just has to happen over and over and over and over again Right. That's one thing that I think sometimes people say, well, you know, I had the conversation, there's nobody wanted to do it. Right. Or, or, you know, we had it a couple of times and now ah, there wasn't any interest. Right. And it has to be something that is a continuous conversation over and over. If you really believe that what you're trying to do is going to make a difference, then you have to keep talking about it and evangelize. You really become an evangelist around this. Right. And we've certainly seen that uh, where, um, the adoption of these sort of newer approaches is successful is where there's a group of people that have become evangelists, they truly believe, and then they're showing, uh, and again, it's a start small idea, right? Let's start small, show that value at that, at that smaller scope, and then expand, uh, expand yeah. from there. How much time do we have? I think we- Yeah, we have about five I more mean, minutes. Joe, we could have a whole session on organizational change. <laughs> right, um, right. But I do, besides communication, which I think is most important, I, I mentioned it earlier, it's, it's, it's also training. I think it, it gets overlooked yeah. uh, quite a bit, which is 
really providing and enabling your, your people with, with the tools, not just giving them tools and asking them to figure it out, but actually investing in that. I, I think that we, we've, we're finding that, you know, anytime we engage in a, a, any type of initiative with one of our organizations, we, we ask, you know, what's your, what's your training and enablement plan? Because otherwise, this is, this is a, this, we might do the thing, but it's not gonna continue to last. So you touched on legacy systems and the, the issues around those. And it, yeah, historically, IT organizations have sort of, they've chosen a system that fits in with their architecture and then over time that gets very heavily customized for, for the purpose. And digitization really is putting data ahead of systems is part of what it's about. So I wonder, you know, and, and then as long as a system can speak the data language that, that is in the organization, you ought to be able to move away from legacy systems as long as other systems can, can create the same data. So I wondered what you think the potential is for, for getting away from legacy systems by having digitization allowing you to switch in systems much more fluidly. Um. You still have your large ERP system, which I would consider as a legacy, right? um, <laughs> which creates a lot of headache. Um, I, I, I would agree with you, you know, have a decent data architecture, right? have an idea of what the data is that you actually want to have, and then you should be able right, to to get rid of some of the legacy maybe, or you know, have a, a more useful architecture. Um, but it's a long way, I think. Because you know, quite honestly, SAP is not gonna go away anytime soon as one of the central pieces. Right? I, I think we see this, um, you know, it's one of those things you don't really see it until you, you go out there and you look back and, and see how things have changed. Um, you know, at least from an AWS perspective, that's really what's been happening on the storage and compute side for a long time. Like, legacy databases are, are kind of a thing in the past on premise. It's it's now possible that you could spin up purpose built databases for what your what the type of data, whether it be time series or or uh, event based. And, and so, you know, we've seen that transformation happen. I think where it's starting to come in is actually more in the um, you know, the, the integration the API as you're talking about, how do you get data out of the system? Where you're starting to see that move into more of the application space is, is to, if, if the system isn't able to actually evolve with the architecture and the data strategy you have, well then that's a time to look at that and reevaluate, is that the right, is that the right system? So, you know, for example, sorry, I'm, I'm seeing um, more and more of that happening now, um, particularly just with a lot of the, technologies that are here today present at the conference, but even with like things like integrating with shop floor equipment, you know, you're actually putting, you know, gateways and IoT edge devices and bringing that data to the cloud that didn't really exist in the past. There was, it, it's, it's starting to percolate, but I, I, I do think there, it's, it's that evolution. But there's still, you know, the, even if we, we talk about cell and gene therapies, cutting edge, you know, science, right? But honestly, shitty instruments, right? That have. <laughs> that have no, you know, no functionality of getting any data out whatsoever, right? It's a black box and it sits there, right? And um, that is still a problem, right, that we're facing. And, you know, other pieces that, you know, we had, we, we talked to some vendor and we were asking, you know, what is your API? And they were saying, well, it's the API that you want us to, to be, right? So, in fact, you don't have one, right? So it's like, there's still a lot of, you know, legacy architecture also out there, legacy technology, and, you know, not everything, I, I said earlier, we, we try to go with the, not always the latest, but at least good technology, right, or modern technology, um, but there's still a lot of systems out there that don't have that, right, and um, that is on the hardware side, that is on, you know, different applications in, in all layers that you, that you mentioned before in the S95 layer, right, um, so there is still a long way to go. And you know, one of the questions is, how do we get there as an industry, right? And there's been a number of standardization 
bodies or initiatives that, yeah, turned out so and so, right? Um, so I don't have a really good answer, but it is a long way to go still. Well, on that note, and actually I think later on we're going to hear some discussions around possible approaches to data mobility and, and, and some of the uh, ideas that are being put together around that. But thank you for a... Uh, Yash, we, we started a few minutes early. Sorry, Ryan, over oh, here. Oh, okay. Um, okay so that's we got fine. five minutes left, if it's okay with okay, you. Okay, that's fine. Um, I was looking at the clock, absolutely. Yeah, sorry. Uh, hi, um, so yeah. I'm, uh, my name is Kay Olan. Right now I'm, in, I'm a CMC PM, but uh, oh, maybe I should send on this side. No, 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 <laughs> you're all right. Everyone is like... <laughs> um, so... Um, my, my previous uh, uh, job, I have the opportunity, I wanted to get to the point about the people attributes and about the transformation. And uh, I want to bring up about this social capital. And I think it's very, very, very important if you can relate to that. So one idea at that time when I was uh, uh, working with, um, with this kind of uh, digital transformation space is um, I just organized a lunch and learn. But I called it something about uh, I don't even remember the name, something about cafe. And everyone bring their own lunch, but I find the people within my organization, within my company, but different departments who are those people who are a little bit advanced and interested in, in digital stuff. They may be doing it on the sideline, but just out of their own hobby, and, and you bring those people together, and I organize different topics and share. And not only share, we record as well, and also bring online to enable um, other part of the comp company's different sites can also dial in and li 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 listen. And it's amazing because you learn, you get to know, learn about your colleagues, but at the same time you learn about, oh, you can do this kind of things. It's so interesting. You can actually apply to the pharma area, your workplace. So, so it's, it, in, it has the creativity, it has the networking opportunities. It's just wonderful and it's relaxing, it's fun. And I told people, Regardless of your, I don't care about your job level, you know, your, your uh, technicians, your, um, your, your VP, doesn't matter. Everyone has something to share and just come in and share. So I, I want to kind of mention that about that, that evolution process, the digital transformation, sometimes will come with inside your organization and, and that's a good, good example that, that I have, you know, uh, gone through. Uh, another one I want to kind of comment on that is, um, so one time, um, my, my previous uh, um, uh, department, everybody's in pain. It's extremely pain. Everyone cannot see a big picture. And, and each group leaders has their own Excel spreadsheet to manage the workload. And now you know the problem, right? The minute you heard about Excel spreadsheet, they're using the 80s, uh, 80s, 90s tool to solve the 21st century's problem. That's number one, you know, is out of capacity. So, so at the point point, it's a great opportunity to introduce a tool that people are already familiar with, but you apply that tool to this digitalized workflow, and it's very easy to, for people to adapt. And I had a successful you know, case studies about that. So I just want, want, want to share you know, this uh, to who, who comments. Well, thank, thank you, Karen. Yeah. I think the, the, the idea of the social capital piece is really, really um, interesting, and it, it's a great way to to, to um, sort of do, to, to share these, these concepts and sort of do what we're doing here uh, today, uh, you know, uh, and this week, but doing it within your own organization. What, uh, one thing that we have at Bayer, what I think is, is pretty interesting, you know, if you look at demographics, right, and people that come in, and, I mean, I see it with my kids, they're not yet working, but they are digitally quite advanced, I would say, right, so the generation that is coming in has, Certainly different expectations, right? But also different background. Um, but one thing that at Bear we did, um, or we have, is something that's called reverse mentoring, right? So where very junior people actually are mentoring, you know, senior leaders on technology, right? Um, so I think that's also something that that you know is is an interesting approach. Yeah. Uh, so I have a question, like o Oliver mentioned, like Bayer was one of the first uh, like companies to adopt something like the cloud and they have their own uh, account. But as well, Chris talked about like AWS infrastructure and they take the burden from that 
perspective, the operations, so on and so forth. But AWS is more than the infrastructure because they uh, already provide you services. These services are managed sometimes like for machine learning or for like text tracks, stuff like this. So sometimes the problem is not that the company doesn't want to transform. They want to, to do the transformation, but by themselves. So they either would have on-premise or data centers, or they would like to implement the cloud themselves. The problem comes with some something like, for, for example, QB Division, which is cloud-based, and we are telling them they like the software so much, and we are in the cloud, and they wanted to use the, the, the software, but they don't was, uh, want to use it you are in the cloud, but you are the one who control it. You have it in your account, correct? It's hosted in the cloud, but it's non, uh, not in our cloud. So sometimes the problems that comes with the very big companies, they, you find them, like we tell them, okay, you like the software, you, you can buy the software, it's in the cloud, we have this security stuff, so on and so forth. And they come and tell us, like they do the search, and they say, okay, why to not use AWS on-premise? Okay, and then it comes with, okay, they have a service on premise, so we can get the server out of AWS, boot it in our premise, and you host your software in the premise. So sometimes AWS itself is like making the problem for, for, for the companies who is trying to, so what I wanted to ask you is, how you encourage people because some, some companies would die because of that, correct? Like, they, they, they cannot sell. They ask them to host AWS in the cloud, yep. and you don't provide all the services in the yep. cloud, correct? Yep. So how, how you would, like, encourage people to adopt such mentality? Like, you can use other softwares that are hosted in the cloud if one, two, three, you met yep. such criteria. We do, we do have AWS on prem. It's called Outpost. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> just, anyways, we, just to make the matter even more confusing for everybody. Um, no, it's, 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 you know, anytime you're going through this type of industry transformation, I said it's 15 years old, but it's still a lot of these use cases, a lot of the work workloads that we're putting into AWS and the business models we're creating around that are creating new opportunities. So, I don't think we have an answer to that specific question in the sense that um, those are the type of challenges we have to work through as we go to this new model of leveraging compute, leveraging machine learning, leveraging these new capabilities that are accessible to pretty much anybody at the tip, at a click of a button. And, and so, um, you know, I think we're, my, my experience is the industry is working through that you know, how do, we, how do we create business models around this new technology? How do we make sure that we, we support the, the, the needs of our customers? Um, but at the same time, like, the innovation will keep coming. And so the options are there. We always say you have the option. So you have the choice to use it or you have the choice not to use it. That's what we try to enable. It's your choice. Um, you pay for what you use. And if you don't want to use it, then you don't use it. So. One, last One last question, all right. Uh, I, I don't want to do the wrap up, let's say, of this session here. But uh, what I'm what I'm seeing here, we have cultural acceptance elements. We have discussion on structure, on data architectures, etc. Um, I just wanted to say, after after that hour, um, I'm missing the user perspective. That means really having the use case in the center, or better, even the patient centricity in center. What we are doing here, okay? So I think that's. All what we are doing here is patient centricity, okay? And then we should peel out the use cases from there. I think that's the main issue which I wanted to, to go. And then, let's say, all of us which started a company say always, uh, structure follows strategy. The same here, right? If the use case is clear, the data architecture will follow in, in that sense, okay? That means, and the use case is probably twofold. Uh, once, it's, of course, the business driver, I agree, uh, of course, it has to have a business case, but I think always asking, also for social acceptance and cultural acceptance, always, what is in for me? I think that's a very important thing. How does this step really um, simplify my life, personally? If we address that in the same business or use case, okay, then I think it's easy to get to the low-hanging fruits and get hook up many people here. Just my thoughts on that. All right. We'll stay up. I think Great. we're uh, time to wrap up. Thank you all for a wonderful conversation. Really interesting. Thank you, Oliver and Chris, for your insights. Thank you. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you, yeah, absolutely. Thanks.
Frau Kaube.